Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. And I um, am excited that we have our second week of our, odd, our ARC Fraud Awareness Month. And today we have guest presenters from Ethica, and um, we have our ARC folks on here, and I'm Judy Howard with ARC and our customer experience area. And I am going to do a few introductions before we get into the meat of the presentation today. I'm going to introduce Cornelius Hutting, who is our Director of Risk Management and Compliance here at ARC. He's been with us for over a couple of years, and he and his team have already made a lot of really great and positive changes. Cornelius comes to us with a world of experience, literally. He's worked pretty much all over the globe, from Asia to Europe, Middle East, Africa, the U.S. And sitting here with us today also uh, at ARC is Doug Nass, who also comes to us with a great amount of experience. Most, A lot of it's here at ARC. He's been with us for over 25 years, and 23 of that has been in the area of fraud. But to get uh, to the meat of things with our guest presenters today from Ethica, uh, we have Keith Briscoe, who Keith comes to us. Um, he is the Chief Marketing and Product Officer there. He, has, uh, he leads Ethica's global product and marketing functions. His role spans um, for development of Ethica's suite of collaboration-based fraud chargeback and migration and transaction acceptance solutions. Uh, he also works in integrated marketing programs. So he has his function um, incorporates everything from product strategy to new product innovation, competitive, competitive analysis, stakeholder communications, and pretty much everything in between. And also with um, Keith on the phone today, I'm really happy to announce Julie Ferguson, who's the Senior Vice President there of, of Ethica, of Industry Solutions. Uh, Julie also has a broad array of experience in the industry. She's considered one of the industry's foremost experts on internet payment fraud. She has over 20 years of experience of online payments and fraud management. And I think the coolest part of all, she holds a couple pet patents for secure transaction order management processing and preventing fraud and electronic transactions. She's held a lot of different positions again, um, like all of the folks here, Keith and Doug, or, well, Cornelius, um, in different companies. But um, before we get started as well, I want to go over a few housekeeping um, things that if anyone on the phone wants to ask questions today, everyone will be muted. You can go to your control panel on the right. There's a area that says questions and just type those in. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of really great knowledge and experience on the phone, so I encourage you all on the phone to ask questions. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to uh, Julie and Keith to get started. Well, great, Judith. Thank you so much for the, uh, the warm introduction. I'm sure I speak on behalf of Julie in uh, thanking ARC for this opportunity to present to uh, our, our guests on the webinar this morning or this afternoon, that's great. Um, we'll get right into it. I wanted to spend a couple of moments just on the agenda really quick, just to give people a sense of the overall areas that we're gonna to cover today. Um, before we get into you know discussion about genuine fraud and as well as friendly fraud, we did wanna have a quick discussion just to kind of level set and provide some context around false declines. And you know, really, really quick before we get into that, the reason why we're doing that is because I think everyone's realizing that the, the industry conversation is really changing these days. Um, five or ten years ago, I think we were very focused on wanting to stop as much fraud as possible, the OPEX and recovery opportunities related to that, and that's still very much the case. But I think what we're seeing now and what the industry is really gravitating toward is how can we actually optimize these efforts to better stop fraud but also capture the potential false to clients and, and begin to undo that opportunity. Um, it's something that is definitely beginning to captivate the industry. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about what false declines actually were and why that's relevant from a genuine fraud and friendly fraud perspective. So Julie, next slide, please. So false declines, just to quickly define that, false declines essentially occur when good transactions are wrongly rejected due to the suspicion of fraud. Um, as a result of that, what we often see is the outcome is that car dealers will elect to abandon a purchase potentially, they'll seek out a different product or perhaps a different airline reservation via another provider, or they might even use a different alternative payment card. Um, this is something that's fairly negative for all parties in the ecosystem. And just to give you a sense of what the actual ratios look like, I'm sure that many on the call have you know, seen a lot of research around the false decline area, but you know, some of the, the key ratios are around 13 to 1. So, 
Um, Javelin, for example, estimates that for $118 billion in actual rejected transactions, $9 billion of that is only actual fraud. So you can see that there's an enormous opportunity that, that, that is being lost here due to suspicion of fraud. So that's something that I think has really caused the industry to sit up and pay attention. It's certainly capturing the, uh, you know, the concerns of our OTA and airline customers as well. And it's, it's all about how do we potentially begin to minimize those false declines while still optimizing the ability to take friendly fraud and genuine fraud out of the equation. So next slide, Julie. And, and of course, what are some of the you know, negative impacts of, of false declines across the ecosystem? For you know, example, there's lost sales and revenue. Obviously, it's a poor customer experience. If you're dealing with a loyal customer who is used to transacting with you or for any card issuer, for example, that wants to keep that customer's card at the top of their wallet, being falsely rejected is obviously a, a horrendous customer experience. You know, our thinking is, you know, for the airline industry, given just the, the nature of the slim margins in the category, you know, the nature of the ticket sizes and so forth, any kind of false decline incident has an even greater impact just because of the potential loss of financial value and the difficulty in replacing loyal customers. Again, as we said, we are encouraging essentially customers to use competitors when a false decline occurs. And there is a certain amount of brand damage that will also uh, occur as a result of a false decline incident as well. So there's no doubt that, you know, across all merchant categories, particularly the airline and travel sectors, false declines are a, a very poor experience. And we want to begin to do everything we can to address that. So Julie is going to take you through some of the, the research we've done around declines just to provide some additional context around where the majority of declines come from to help kind of set the stage for what we're talking about here in the airline and uh, travel sector. So over to you, Julie. Thanks. So um, one of the things that we took a look at is when a card goes out for authorization and gets a decline, why is it getting a decline? We noticed that a lot of stuff gets coded as do not honor. And we wanted to really understand what does that do not honor bucket mean? And so we worked with some of our issuing partners to actually get real breakdowns of what was behind the scenes. And what we found was the majority of the time for merchants, um, so in this graph you'll see 44% of the time across all the merchants, it was due to insufficient funds. And 9.4% of the time it was due to fraud. And then you can see the, uh, there's also a percentage that's lost and stolen and then just general errors like bad CVC or, or AVS codes being typed in or even just a bad credit card number. So um, you can kind of see that the makeup, a, a small sliver of that is fraud. What was really interesting is when we took a look at the travel industry, that fraud bucket actually grew. And the first um, airline that we took a look at, you'll see that bucket really um, reflects not too different from the general merchant population. But when you look at um, airline number two, they actually are a 3D secure um, airline. And you can see the impact. 29% um, of their declines are due to the suspicion of fraud. And so um, one of the things that we really focused on is what do you do with these declines and how, how do you react? And one of the things that we also learned when we started talking to the issuers is false declines hurt the issuer just as much as it hurts the merchant. So um, for the issuers, they're actually losing um, up to 361 million um, cardholders um, that when that cardholder tries to purchase and it gets declined, they actually whip out another card and use that instead. And that's one of the issuer's big fears. Um, as Keith had mentioned, there's the 13 to 1 ratio. And then when a cardholder does move their card to back of wallet or stop using that card, that cardholder has a value somewhere between $3,900 and $48,000 in value to that issuer. So it really can be a pretty impactful um, loss to the issuer. Additionally, um, merchants lose up to $264 billion in sales. Um, and then the other thing that we learned is 52% of the orders that merchants are actually declining. So you get it and you take a look at it. You don't really know. You, maybe it's in your manual review queue. You've investigated it. and You just can't make a good decision, so you choose to decline it. We actually worked with the issuers to look at those transactions that were declined by a merchant. 52% of them turned out to be good. Um, so that also creates a bad customer experience. And so the other thing that we also learned uh, measuring this with some of our, our key merchant partners is 32% of the merchants who try, who make a purchase and it gets declined either by the merchant or by the issuer, 
actually doesn't um, doesn't continue to make that purchase. So those truly do become lost sales. The other thing um, that we took a look at after understanding the details around the problem were best practices. So what can a merchant do to reduce their false declines? The first thing we recommend is that you measure your false decline rate. So um, there's a couple of different ways um, you as a merchant can do that. One is you can review the orders that were canceled where the cardholder called you back and said, you know what, that really was me, what happened to my order, and you end up reinstating the order. The other thing that you can do is pick a random sampling of orders that were canceled either by you or by the issuer and just have somebody on your team pick up the phone and call them, call the cardholder and say, hey, um, was this really you and try to do a little bit of fraud investigations on your own. It's a little bit more work, but it's a good way to measure and get a feel if there's revenue that you are declining or that the issuer is declining that you could, um, in fact, uh, restore and, and, and keep. Um, the other thing that we've learned is merchants and issuers should collaborate. So if you see weird patterns um, or you have a particular problem with an issuer, um, we encourage you to reach out um, and try to talk to that issuer um, or um, even share information. The other thing that we've learned um, in, in doing this research is that when you're going out for authorization and settlement, make sure that you do AVS and CVC checks. Those two checks are something that the issuer is using, and even though it may come back as no match, the, the fact that you as a merchant are sending that data tells the issuer, hey, this is a good merchant. And so the likelihood of it getting approved increases slightly. Additionally, if you have um, your setup where cardholders can keep their credit card on file and log into their account to book travel um, or make reservations, then make sure you're using that account on file flag, set that. That also uh, gives the issuer a lot of information saying, hey, this consumer has purchased from this merchant before and they're most likely gonna be a good consumer. And then the, the final um, bit of advice we wanted to leave with you with as we're talking about false declines is don't make decisions on the do not honor decline reason code from the issuer. As I showed you a couple slides ago, that do not honor really behind the scenes has a lot of variation anywhere from the customers over the limit to they haven't paid their card to the credit card got lost or stolen. With that, I'm gonna switch over to start talking about genuine fraud. So genuine fraud refers to fraud that is knowingly committed by the criminal or groups for the purpose of illegally acquiring goods, services, or information. So this is really true fraud. Merchants and issuers, card issuers have strong fraud management systems, but today there really isn't a good, reliable, scalable way to share information. And so what we found is that both the merchant and the issuer suffer high, charge, high fraud and chargeback losses decline those transactions and create a poor customer experience. So we actually went and said, all right, if the merchant were to share information with a issuer and an issuer were to share information with um, an issuer, if a merchant shared with an issuer and an issuer shared with a merchant because they know about fraud the other doesn't see, what impact would that have? So can collaboration really help fight fraud? And what we found is 58% um, of the fraud an issuer sees, the merchant actually doesn't know about. So a lot of times the merchant will go out for authorization, they'll get the approval, but then the issuer's systems will trigger, they'll call out to the cardholder and later on find out it's fraudulent. So 58% of the time when that happens, the merchant actually had gone ahead and approved that transaction. On the flip side of that, the fraud that merchants see because of their fraud detection tools, 19% of the time, the issuer actually didn't know about the fraud, even though the merchant did. So by sharing that information of, of the fraud knowledge a merchant has with an issuer, it actually was able allowed the issuer to catch more fraud as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to Keith to kind of walk you through a collaboration uh, case study. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And I think, you know, suffice to say, I mean, I think what those numbers really demonstrate are the nature of the blind spots that occur on the merchant and the issuer side when they are really operating in isolation without sharing that kind of important intelligence. So before we get into the, the actual merchant issuer collaboration data flow, I wanted to just contrast this with the, and the, the setup for this is really all about comparing this with the existing chargeback process. Um, we don't have the slide in here 
directly comparing that, but I wanted to talk about that really quick because it's important. I think, as we all know, the chargeback process is incredibly painful. It's very archaic. It's outdated. It can often take four to six weeks for a merchant to actually hear about the confirmation of fraud through the chargeback process. And again, that's all because the chargeback process was never really designed for that purpose. The difference between the chargeback process then and the collaboration network is the ability to provide data at speed and at scale. And when it comes to actually stopping fraud and making a material impact to potentially stop the, the criminal and resell the ticket, it really is all about the speed of that data confirmation and how quickly the issuer can notify the merchant of that potential fraud. Um, obviously, via the chargeback process, if you have something like a criminal uh, buying a ticket and coming to board a plane in a fairly short period of time, if the merchant doesn't actually find out about that until after the chargeback is received, that's far too late to actually take any kind of action. So it's really all about speed of notification and the ability to take action on that data. So very, very simply, the, the merchant collaboration network concept is an entity or a network that sits between merchants and issuers at scale who can actually take that confirmed uh, intelligence, that confirmed fraud intelligence that they, the issuer is detecting directly with the cardholder and make it immediately available to the merchant. So Julie, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll quickly walk through um, just how simply that works. So effectively what happens is that once the cardholder is on the phone potentially confirming a fraudulent incident with the issuer, the issuer is then through the collaboration network sending that information directly to the merchant. In this case, it could be an airline, could be an OTA. Um, the airline or OTA is then actually actioning that directly, sometimes within as, as quickly as a few hours to actually potentially cancel that ticket, cancel the booking, potentially resell the goods, and disrupt the criminal. And it, it's always about disrupting the criminal. If you can actually thwart the criminal activity, that is a great message and a great disincentive to potentially repeating that type of behavior. Um, after we, we provide the ability for the airline or the OTA to action that alert, there is then an outcome that's transmitted back to the issuer so that they can understand how successful that data has been in actually helping to thwart that activity. So that is the very simple way that collaboration through a kind of network entity like Epica can actually make sure that data is flowing very quickly and, and at scale to ensure that it's making a significant financial impact. Now on the next slide, we'll talk through a couple of the high level anonymized case studies that we've seen in the actual fraud fighting results. So as you can see, I mean, some of these numbers are fairly material on an annual basis. So we have a Canadian airline customer, for example, who stopped almost $4.5 million of fraud in a 12 month period. Uh, U.S. airline about 1.5, a British airline about 2.1, a low-cost carrier about 1.3, and an online agency about 1.1. So it, as you can see, the, the whole benefit of this kind of network as well is not only can you make a material impact to actually stop the criminal and recover some of those associated losses, there's also this idea of network effect. So the more actual airlines and OTAs that take part in this kind of network, the more actual recovery benefit there is for a card issuer, and then the more issuers join, providing even more benefit for merchants. So that's the kind of network effect and kind of value creation that we eventually see through this kind of model. Um, and it, as you can see, it's generating some material results for some of the customers on our platform. So just to summarize again, how this kind of collaboration can actually, actually help fight genuine fraud. So again, the sharing of data is all about taking action on that to actually avoid some of those losses and recover from an OPEX perspective. There's also the ability now, as, as Julie mentioned, when both parties understand that there's fraud that has been identified by the other, they then have the ability to update their fraud models, ensure that those tools actually function more effectively going forward. And it's all about that, that, that key window also that exists uh, between the actual notification and discovery of fraud. You can imagine that through something like the chargeback process, if there's a, a six week delay potentially, there could be an incredible amount of fraud that is associated with those original transactions that's going to occur in that time. So the sharing of this data um, through a network like, like ours can actually provide that kind of uh, speed advantage and that time advantage. Um, as I mentioned, the merchants and airlines OTAs can keep criminals off airplanes and out of hotels. I think we all understand that the you know, the, the cost dynamics and the economics in these sectors are such that it's really pivotal that if you've got five or six open seats left on an aircraft, you want actual legitimate paying customers to be occupying those seats and not fraudsters. Those are transactions that are ultimately going to turn into chargebacks and five or six or 10 seats can make the difference between a profitable flight and an unprofitable flight. So that's really key. Um, additionally, there is the opportunity for merchants to resell tickets, as we mentioned, uh, again, making sure that we're selling that to legitimate customers, not fraudsters. 
and again, we mentioned this note of this notice of you know speed. Speed really kills in this overall um, segment. It's really all about providing the, the opportunity to quickly act and stop fraud. It also does prevent repeat offenders and abusers from continually coming back and exploiting defenses as well. So that's a quick summary of how we can actually utilize the collaboration model to fight genuine fraud. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit into friendly fraud. So I think as everybody has, has probably realized and, and has probably paid attention to some of the, the current dynamics in friendly fraud, we wanted to really start with a very quick definition of what friendly fraud actually is. There are sometimes some different interpretations of what constitutes friendly fraud. So we think about friendly fraud as a type of transaction where an individual had knowledge of the transaction, they were potentially complicit with it, and or they somehow benefited from it. Um, this is a transaction against their own account, and the individual is ultimately reporting that transaction as unauthorized. So three key dimensions, knowledge, complicity, and whether they actually benefited from the actual transaction. So friendly fraud, as we'll discover on this next slide, is really a spectrum of behavior. Uh, and this is something that I think is, is gradually starting to get more awareness, but because of the spectrum of activity, it has, you know, far-reaching consequences, ultimately. At the very most kind of benign end of the spectrum, we have something as simple as descriptor confusion. This is a card holder looking at their online statement, very simply doesn't recognize uh, the merchant and, and therefore doesn't understand that they actually perform that transaction. There's also the case of, of a household type of friendly fraud. This is often called second party fraud, where you have a, you know, a child or you know, a sibling potentially transacting against a, a parent's account or a brother or sister's account. The primary account holder does not realize that that transaction was performed on their account and they therefore dispute that transaction. That's called household fraud. There's also, as we now begin to tip into the more nefarious end of the spectrum, there's the, uh, the notion of something called buyer's remorse. I think, you know, again, we're all fairly familiar with what happens when an air ticket is, is booked perhaps uh, on the spot spontaneously. There's later a kind of buyer's remorse action that happens when a car dealer perhaps realizes that from a financial perspective, that was a rash purchase. They later dispute as a result and claim they didn't perform that transaction. And at the very kind of more criminal end of the friendly spot fraud spectrum, we really have this idea of a cardholder who is intent on gaming the system. And, and this is really all about a cardholder who has learned and understood how to exploit the chargeback process to their own game. They've connected the dots, they understand they can dispute a transaction, they can get the benefit of the good or service, but not actually end up paying for the good or service. So that's what we've referred to as gaming the system. And suffice to say, I mean, friendly fraud is really a, a horrendous, a horrendous experience for all entities in the payment ecosystem. So on the cardholder side, again, we talked about the bad experience associated with that. There is purchase friction that will ultimately result if that card is unnecessarily canceled. If that customer has other cards on file, online accounts and so forth, recurring billing and payments, those will also break and they have to be replaced with a new card. And then there's just the overall pain of the card reissue process as well. For a merchant, of course, there's also that bad customer experience. There's the lost revenue associated with that transaction. There's the downstream chargeback and representment cost. And then ultimately what this is going to lead to, as we discussed earlier, was the, the notion of false declines and decreased acceptance. No merchant or card issuer, of course, ever wants to see that. On the issuer side, again, very common across all categories, terrible customer experience. It increases an issuer's cost of, of recovery. There's gonna be inbound claim volume, um, inbound volume and increase as customers call in to dispute transactions. There's the impact, as I think Julie talked to earlier, this notion of back of wallet. If a card has to be reissued, it's very possible a customer is then going to pull out a different card in their wallet and make that their primary card. There's this idea of, of rules engine noise, so effectively what happens, and I think Julie will talk to this upcoming, is that the fraud models in real time will learn to actually learn from the confirmation of fraud that's being recorded and you have legitimate transactions effectively being recorded as fraud. So that's also a, a key issue there as well. So with that, I think I'm handing off to Julie at this point to talk about some of the research we've seen over a period of years in, in terms of the increase in friendly fraud. We ran these numbers in 2016 and 18 and there's some interesting differences that Julie's gonna walk you through. Yeah, so we took a look at um, friendly fraud and actually measured it with, uh, um, with a couple hundred of our customers and said, okay, what percentage of the fraud that you see today is really friendly fraud? And we actually measured it across the industries. And you can see for airline and ticketing in 2016, friendly fraud was 6% of the transactions on average. So the majority of the fraud 
that the travel industry was experiencing really was genuine or true fraudsters, criminals. And then what happened when we reran the survey um, recently is the travel industry, like all the other industries, actually had a significant, significant increase. And the companies that we were speaking with when they measured it, about 39% of the fraud that they're seeing is friendly fraud. And so the impact to this is that good transactions are now actually coded as fraud because these transactions, the issuer thinks is fraud, they don't know that it's friendly fraud. Um, and so they don't differentiate between a, a criminal and a consumer who's just changed their mind. Um, the other thing that's happening because these things are getting coded as fraud, the next time a consumer with that profile or a similar profile comes through, the model is now going to say, oh, that looks like fraud. So it's actually contributing to that false decline problem we talked about at the beginning. So across the board, merchants, issuers, and acquirers um, are declining more transactions and good customers are getting turned away. So some of the unique things about when you look at friendly fraud specifically for the travel industry is um, a lot of this friendly fraud is occurring because there's simply policies or charges that the consumer didn't understand or didn't, doesn't necessarily agree with, um, especially now that there's so many more baggage fees and there's so many more amenities at hotels and rental car, there's the toll fees, the GPS. So, so there's lots of different fees that, that maybe consumers didn't really understand. Um, so those charges will happen. Additionally, um, there's dissatisfaction with the service before, during, or after the trip. Um, another phenomenon when I was talking to some of our um, travel uh, travel customers is uh, shopping under the influence. So everybody's up late at night hanging out with their buddies and say, hey, let's book a trip and go on vacation. And then the next morning they wake up and go, oh, I don't know if I can really afford that. Um, and they wait a couple of days and attempt to cancel it and it's too late. And so they call into their issuing bank and say, hey, that was fraud. That wasn't me. Um, and then additionally, there's just the heavy buyer's remorse of, oh, you know, I really wanted to do this trip, but now I can't afford it or, or, or do this, this hotel stay. So um, that really is the, the different types of friendly fraud um, that we see across uh, the travel industry. And with that, I'll turn it back to Keith to talk about a specific uh, case study. Yeah, thanks, Julie. We're going to uh, talk really quick. Unfortunately, South African Airways wasn't available to actually participate in the webinar today, but kindly they allowed us to kind of talk to their business case and, a, you know, the case study we've used in a couple of presentations at conferences with them in the past. So we'll go to the next slide, Julie. And I don't think based on, you know, some of the, the friendly fraud reasons you just talked to, um, this will be a surprise for South African Airways. You know, one of the key issues for them was this idea of buyer's remorse that was increasing in frequency. Um, often there was a declaration from the customer that the service was not actually provided or the service was somehow defective. And often there is, you know, key difference with um, refund rules, for example. So, you know, despite the, the extent to which a merchant might go to make sure that a refund rules and set of policies are obvious to customers, there is often a case of customers just not understanding that and ultimately disagreeing with those refund rules. So we see these fairly commonly as the, the drivers for friendly fraud, and it was certainly the case with South African Airways. So in terms of some of the challenges that they faced in dealing with these specific types of transactions, so the, the financial impact, clearly, I mean, one of the things that South African Airways took a very aggressive stance when it came to actually fighting some of this behavior that they saw um, with their customers around friendly fraud, one of the, the key indicators is just the fact that, look, it's, it's a financial impact situation. These are very high value transactions, and they're ultimately very meaningful and material. You know, often you have cases where it's also very difficult to dispute because you have a difference in terms of the card that was used and the actual customer name. There's the, you know, the investigation component of this as well. Actually engaging with the customer and proving out that a transaction was legitimate is very time consuming and labor intensive. And, you know, for every merchant, there's this balance to be struck as well between making it easy for the customer to actually transact and again, minimizing this idea of purchase friction, but also ensuring there's an element of merchant protection in the mix as well. Um, when we talk about fraud and, and balancing the whole spectrum of acceptance, it really is all about striking that particular balance between making it easy to transact, but also ensuring that your interests and financially you are protected. So we'll, we'll go into, I think at this point, the actual financial impact of what it looked like for a true cost of a chargeback for South African Airways. So industry-wide, it's, it's often very common. What we typically hear 
for many merchant segments, including airlines and travel, is that the true cost of a chargeback can often be two to three times the actual value of the ticket. And I think we see that something is very consistent there with South African Airways as well. So in looking at the overall chargeback payable, for them it was $830 as the value of the ticket. The total additional cost of the airline was an additional 818 pounds. And so that comes from a couple of different areas. So there's the inability to resell the ticket depending on um, the actual window of time that that fraud was discovered. Often it's, it's too late to actually resell the ticket. That accounted for 300 pounds. There are the airport taxes that have to be paid to authorities. As you can see, that's a very sizable number as well at 318 pounds. And then based on the, the nature of itinerators that have multiple carriers, there's also the prorate that's payable to other carriers that were on that ticket. In this case, and in this particular example, that amount was 200 pounds. So when you add up all those additional costs to the airline, the true cost of that chargeback to South African Airways was actually six, around 650 pounds. So again, it's, it's something that below the line and beneath the iceberg, you see all of those additional costs that just exacerbate the overall financial impact of a chargeback. So hopefully that, um, that example resonates for, for I think many on the call and on the webinar. And again, it's directly in that range of the two to three ratio that we often see. So again, in terms of consequences and consequences, which we'll talk about a little bit more further in the webinar too, that's a very important element in helping to actually sought friendly fraud. Unless you can actually demonstrate some specific set of consequences or actions to the cardholder, to the customer, often that behavior will continue to repeat. So for South Africa, they would often take customers to small claims court depending on the actual ticket value. They would actually consider suspending the frequent flyer account as well. So again, for a customer who is perhaps not a repeat abuser, they actually rely on their South African Airways account uh, to continue to transact and get benefit from. So that's a consequence that makes customers often rethink their approach to falsely disputing a transaction. And then there's this idea, of course, of you know, negative lists for future travel. So as is often the case, if South African would see that their customers are repeat abusing, they would not actually allow them to book any future travel on South African Airways. So as you guys, I think, can sometimes see here that, that those are very meaningful consequences. For a customer who is ultimately still wanting to not be inconvenienced by any kind of future friction when they make future purchases, those are material consequences that will hopefully help rethink their behavior. And South African definitely did see a change in some of the behavior as a result of having those more aggressive consequences. So I think we're going to shift back to Julie and really talk about the, uh, the collaboration model that we can now use to fight the, the, the forms of friendly fraud that are emerging. Thanks. Yeah, so what, what we're going to talk about now is um, how do we really address this friendly fraud problem? What can we do about it? And what can we do to also have a positive impact on false declines by getting the friendly fraud out of the system? And so, um, as we mentioned at the, earlier in the presentation, you know, a lot of the reason why the, the friendly fraud happens is simply because a consumer doesn't recognize that descriptor, the household purchase, the buyer's remorse in gaming the system. And so we worked with a group of um, large merchants, um, such as Google and Microsoft and uh, Amazon, and we sat down and had a task force that said, why do you guys have so much friendly fraud? Tell us about that problem. And then we partnered with a bunch of issuers, and we said, what, what, what is the problem? And a big part of the problem um, that we learned is that when a cardholder calls in and says, I don't recognize this transaction, I don't know what it is, an issuer then creates a chargeback, and somewhere between a month and a couple of months, they get the answer back from the merchant and they're able to provide it to the cardholder saying that $5 charge or that purchase was for the following items. And so what the issuer said were we really need to be able to provide to our customers in real time when they call in the answer to that question, what is this transaction? Additionally, the information that merchants provide in the chargeback process around compelling evidence, things like um, how long this customer has been a, a customer with that merchant, uh, so the account history, um, did, in an example of travel, did the, the customer actually board the flight and fly and take it, and what's the evidence or proof of that? So bringing all of that information up front in real time to the issuer and to that cardholder when they're confused about that transaction can really deflect 
the friendly fraud or the chargeback from ever even being created. And so um, Ethica, as well as many other vendors out there in, in, the, in the market, have been working on how do you bring compelling evidence up front and how do you really reduce that friendly fraud. And so um, what you're looking at here is a screen where a consumer has called in and said, hey, I don't recognize this transaction. And it's reached out in real time to a merchant to say, hey, give me the details around the transaction. And then the agent at the issuing bank is able to show the consumer and have the conversation, hey, I can see um, that the passenger um, flew Air Canada, Jeremy Smith flew Air Canada, um, and they went from Vancouver to London. And then a passenger, um, Sylvia, uh, went flew from uh, Vancouver to London as well. So do you recognize these names? And they can provide that itinerary and that information um, right in real time to the cardholder to be able to answer that question. They can also provide the cardholder a receipt. They can provide that account history we talked about. They can, um, can provide if the consequences. So in the instance where um, a travel agency might say, you won't be able to book any more um, flights or any more, make any more reservations with us if you do move forward with disputing it, they can share that information with the issuer so the issuer can pass that on to the cardholder and hopefully jog that customer's memory, especially if it really is the cardholder and it is friendly fraud. So. We, we've really come to realize that bringing this information in real time forward makes an enormous difference. Um, some of our customers today are already starting to see between a 35 to 40 percent deflection rate, so in, in avoiding those chargebacks from being created. So really by collaborating and sharing this information, you can make a difference in um, fighting friendly fraud. So with that, um, we'll, we'll walk through a couple of, of key points here. And um, the best practices really around how to combat friendly fraud. So the first one here is leverage your historical data to create household profiles. Um, that is so critical. You want to be able to say, this customer um, has been a customer of ours for a while. Here's the family. Here's what they look like. They typically travel together. So that when you do provide that compelling evidence to an issuer, they can they can see very clearly that the that merch that consumer really did travel and book and and you have a history you know that it's them. So um, some of the things to include in that household profile is the computer or IP address that they're placing the order from, um, typical time of day, email addresses, all those kind of common things to create a profile for that household. The second one is bolstering uh, available compelling evidence to include proof of receipt, consumption of and usage. One of the interesting things in the airline sector is there, there's a visa compelling evidence rule that was introduced um, a few years ago, which allows the, the actual flight manifest to be used as compelling evidence. So whatever you can do to potentially demonstrate that the actual passenger was, was who you think they are and the actual purchaser of that transaction, they actually flew on the aircraft, is, is incredibly compelling and useful. Um, so anything around proof of receipt, consumption, and usage does help potentially combat friendly fraud downstream, either in the form of a representment or upfront in the kind of process that we just talked about. The other thing that everybody should consider is implementing parental controls. So if you um, do have a family that regularly makes purchases, having those parental controls in place can make a difference. Um, and talking to one travel agency, they said a lot of their um, business is from college students booking uh, tickets and taking vacations to come home and see their parents um, over the holidays. And what uh, they were getting a lot of chargebacks around is when those college kids were also booking vacations over spring break or ski trips during a, a winter break. And so having those parental controls in place just so that um, an adult needs to approve it um, or at least they're kept in the loop when other family members are making those purchases can make a difference. Number four is around refund policies. I think when we talk through the South African Airways example, the refund policy aspect of that is fairly critical, making them obvious, making them clear, ensuring the customer actually understands what they're signing up for and what the terms of service actually are is a, definitely a key way of helping to curtail friendly fraud. So refund policy is another critical dimension of uh, best practices.
Another best practice is to really have an, a receipt that's easy to use, especially around service fees and um, other taxes and those sorts of things. I, I travel a lot for work, and oftentimes I will look at my receipt, um, especially when I book through a travel agency, and there's so many components, it's hard to figure out what the total amount is that's going to be charged. And, and if you're charging multiple charges, like there's one that's for the reservation for the hotel, there's another for the airline, and then there's maybe even a service fee for, for the travel agency itself, clearly explaining that in easy to understand words to the consumer is very important and really can help deflect any chargebacks or even create any of those initial calls um, from ever even happening. So the better you can make the information on the receipt, um, the better off you will be. Additionally, on that receipt, having a phone number or a way to contact the merchant, you to ask questions and get clarification is important as well. So number six is the concept of actually calling the customer. And you know this, this runs into the challenge, I think, of overall scale, depending on the nature and the frequency of friendly fraud. But certainly in instances where the ticket size, the actual financial impact warrants it, and the amount of, of compelling evidence and detail you have can be effective in talking the customer off of that dispute, calling the customer can be highly effective in those situations. So where warranted and where you can actually manage it, calling the customer is definitely something we would recommend. And the next one is to implement simple, clearly stated return and refund policies. So a lot of times consumers are confused about how they can get a refund um, or return or cancel their flight. Um, or their hotel. So making sure that that is clear and that they agree to it um, is really important. And the last one is ultimately about consequences. We talked about that in going through the, the South African Airways case study example as well. Customers do have to understand that there will be very meaningful and material consequences if they continue to falsely dispute. And it really is one of the only fundamental ways to change the behavior. If customers don't actually suffer some kind of loss and convenience um, as a result of falsely disputing transactions, the behavior will persist. And we certainly see um, in, in certain sectors that we serve a high repeat offense behavior. And the, the amount of abuse of friendly fraud is beginning to increase. And we've seen that happen over time as well. So the only way, again, to do that is to actually enforce consequences. Right. And actually, along those lines, Keith, we had a question um, from one of the audience members. And their main fraud actually is friendly fraud. And one okay. of the challenges is the airline is the merchant of record. And so when they, try, they, they don't get the opportunity to represent that compelling evidence and they, don't, they really can't fight that chargeback. Um, and so what yep. can be done? And I think you know, if you could talk a little bit about the consequences, I think that can help there. Yeah, so I mean, in that specific instance, I mean, are we referring to a situation where an OTA doesn't have the ability to actually do anything about that just because the airline is the, the merchant of record in that instance? Yeah, and so I think the best thing the OTA could probably do is implement those consequences. And then, um, you know, like uh, what South African Air, Airways uh, did um, a couple slides ago when you talked about it was even, you know, potentially bring it in small claims court dependent on that, you know, size of the ticket and the size of the deal to really go after the funds. Yeah, sorry, I didn't understand where you were kind of heading with that, Julie. But yeah, absolutely. I, I think in those cases where there there is a constraint in being able to fight it, the only way to really kind of begin to change the, the behavior is to get a little bit more aggressive about making the customer understand that there will be some serious consequences. And, you know, although nobody wants to go down the, the legal action route, sometimes that's the only recourse. So, you know, again, I think it reinforces the whole point that, you know, in cases where there is that kind of constraint, where an OTA is not the, the, uh, the agent of record, that, that is a critical dimension of it, is beginning to increase the, the kind of aggressive stance toward that, that behavior ultimately. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that we have seen over and over is once um, a merchant actually starts to implement those consequences and gets a reputation of, hey, if you commit fraud here, um, you need to go, um, the, the fraudsters go somewhere else to commit that fraud. Um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the best examples is Uber has an incredibly strict policy um, around friendly fraud. So if you claim fraud and they have good evidence it was you, 
they actually block your phone um, by the IEMI, the, the device ID on your phone. They block your email address. They block your credit card number. They close down that account. So basically, in order to install Uber on your phone and place an Uber ID, you'd need to get a whole new cell phone. You'd need to get a whole new credit card and set up a brand new account. Um, and so once consumers understand, wow, I won't be able to book anything um, there, I'll have to switch to either a competitor or I need to make right that chargeback that I created. It's really changed the behavior of the consumers and what they're calling in about um, to contest that. Um, we have another question um, about um, if the airlines don't want to help. Um, many a times um, we can stop the fraud before the flights are used, but the airline refuses to help. So that might actually be one for uh, Doug and Cornelius. Yeah, thanks, Julie. This is Doug at ARC. Uh, great question. Uh, definitely a long-standing um, challenge in the industry. Uh, in talking to the carriers over many, many years, they, there's a definite reluctance to intercede in these types of disputes um, because they are uh, they view it as their work. They, they want. They don't necessarily want to take an action when they don't have all the complete information or the 100% confirmation from a bank uh, that a transaction is is fraudulent. So they're not always willing to take on the liability of stopping a passenger and, and uh, stopping them from travel. So that's the reason why. That just the exposure to potential litigation. Is there anything the OTA can do? Is there any advice there? Um, sign up for Ethica. Where, they're, <laughs> where now the, the OTA is in control of the transaction or in control of part of the conversation between the issuer and the card member. Yeah, absolutely. We could get that information to the issuer and, and work to try and set down, shut down those transactions. Because um, I see a couple of folks asking a very similar question as well. So it seems like it's a, it's a problem we, we probably could work on um, just by working with some of the issuers and our airline customers. Exactly. That, that's one of the keys is getting the OTA or the, the issuing travel agency a voice in the transaction. Yeah. And then um, there was also another question um, about AVS and CVC info uh, being released with data breaches. Um, an ARC webinar advised verifications aren't a reliable check that the cardholder is valid. So I absolutely agree. AVS and CVC are not reliable checks that a, a cardholder is good. In fact, there is evidence to prove that AVS and CVC are just as likely to be a fraudulent consumer as a good consumer. But what we did learn is an issuer is also not just looking at the health of, a of the consumer making the purchase, they're looking at the health of a merchant. Is this a good merchant who fo follows all of the industry rules from the banking, uh, banking organization? And so by sending AVS and CVC as part of your authorization stream, what we have recently learned is that actually increases your acceptance rate, not because it comes back as a AVS matched and CVC matched, but because while this merchant collects this information and does their very best to check and look, so we know this merchant is a better merchant than a merchant who doesn't. And so we weren't, we weren't able to uh, measure that before, but um, in working with some of the folks, we were able to, to recently learn that. Um, and Doug, do you have anything else on AVS or CVC? Yeah, um, in, in our usual webinar, uh, like we've, we've known for the last number of years, so much true cardholder data is being sold around the, the, uh, the underground internet from one criminal to another. We are finding that the criminals do have a lot of the legitimate information, but the key would be we, it, it still absolutely needs to be done, those checks, 
it is don't let those be the final determinations whether you are determining whether uh, the customer is who they say they are. You need to take it all a holistic look at everything, um, but please continue to do ABS, CVV, but those are not the be all end all of checks to be done. Okay, and then we have a lot of questions around what our approach would be here at Ethica to preventing a passenger from uh, checking in if they're known to be fraudulent. So what I would say is when there's um, a high ticket transaction and um, you know that that cardholder is fraud, we have strong relationships with the issuers and we can pick up the phone and talk to them about it. If there's enough volume, and this is something we can talk um, to Doug and Cornelius about of maybe being able to create a feed so that we can send this information onto the issuing banks so that they can reach out and talk to the cardholders to confirm that it's fraud so that the airlines could prevent those passengers from boarding in and confirm that it's fraud and cancel those tickets. Um, that Because one of our products, what we do is we send that information to the airline saying, hey, this consumer is confirmed fraud. But what it sounds like is happening is um, you all recognize that it's fraud, but you have no way to cancel that ticket. So that's something we could take as an action item and do a little bit of research on. Okay, and then um, there's one more question um, that came in um, about uh, U.S. issuers aren't sending text messages um, to confirm transactions, and that's common in other countries. Um, is there a way uh, to push the banks to implement that? So um, in the U.S., uh, I know that it really is something that the banks have been rolling out that's customizable. It was made mandatory to have that, at least that ability. Um, within the last year, so all issuers now must offer that. Um, but encouraging cardholders to use it um, is simply an education process because it is an opt-in, whereas in other countries it's really been more of an opt-out. Okay, and then um, Keith, there's a question here around um, what are the ways um, we can prevent chargebacks? Just in general, I mean, I, I think we talked about some of the ways to, you know, ultimately prevent that. Um, you know, ensuring that I think one of the key things is really ensuring that customers actually understand the, the terms of service around what they bought. Um, in, in this sector, it is very challenging just because of the nature of the, the kind of split billing models and the complexities of debit memos and all those kinds of things. But I mean, ultimately, it, it's really important that customers do understand the actual terms of service and understand where, where they can actually have a legitimate reason for dispute and where they shouldn't. Um, you know, again, actually enforcing some of the, the consequences will help because the more customers actually understand what the consequence will be to a false dispute, the better they can actually adjust to that behavior and understand over time that there are certain types of chargebacks that they're simply not going to get away with. So I think there is definitely a range of ways, but those are certainly a couple. Any others you would suggest, Julie? Um, I think those are the ones that, that come to mind. Yeah, so no, not nothing else is popping out at me. Okay, it looks like that's about all of the the questions. Um, so okay. Judy, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Okay. okay, Julie, thank you so much, and thank you, Keith. Thank you, Doug and Cornelius here for jumping in and helping uh, answer uh, some of those questions that's more ARC-related. Uh, there's still a little bit of time we have on the phone, about six minutes, actually. If there's still questions for anyone on the phone that want to write them in, uh, please do so. But I just want to cover a few other things uh, while I do have you on the phone, and we're waiting to see if any other questions come in. Uh, as always, ARC has a, a fraud hotline, so please, if you suspect fraud, you don't know if it's fraud, you're concerned, uh, don't ever feel hesitant to send in requests or to call this number. Uh, we, it's, the phone number is 855-358-0393. Again, that fraud hotline is 855-358-0393. And also, you can send an email to us as well, which is stopfraud at artcorp.com. And that's 
stopfraud at arcarcorp.com. This all can be found on our ARC Corp. I know it's a lot of ARC Corp. ARC Corp. Um, .com website, our corporate site, um, under fraud, and our fraud area and our pages. And if you can't find that right off, just go up with the magnifying glasses, put it in search, and um, you'll be able to select the fraud page. And uh, all these recordings that we're doing this month will be posted there. So in October, I encourage you to take a look. Uh, white papers and some of these uh, case studies will also be posted on there. Uh, we can also do probably the presentations will be. Uh, so it's a great source of information. They always have the newest kind of fraud schemes up there as well. Uh, and um, Julie, I don't know if there's any other questions that have come in since I've been talking. Um, mostly about uh, are the slides going to be available, um, and then um, some really specific questions by one person. I think we need to follow up with her directly. Um, just lots of questions around uh, compelling evidence, um, and we could get into a little bit of here. Um, so, for example, if you do, since you don't have signature, um, it's a you know it's a card not present transaction. Can you still win the charge back? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. There's other things that the issuing bank looks at. They look at IP address. They look at device ID. They look at the history between you and that cardholder um, over time. So all those things can be um, provided with um, as part of the compelling evidence package. Great, and thank then, you, Julie. Uh, yeah. No, go ahead. So that, but, but I think the majority of the questions are coming from just a couple people, so we should probably follow up directly. That's what I recommend. Okay, great. Uh, and then we will work with you, Julie and Keith, on that. Doug and Cornelius were and will, and we'll um, follow up, as Julie said, with uh, those questions specific. Uh, again, um, there are if there are any questions, follow up. You can always contact our customer care area, 855-816-8003. They can get you um, to whatever resource you need. Um, and that's triple CCC help at ourcorp.com. And um, another way to follow us this uh, month is also um, through our hashtag, so through our social media, hashtag ARC prevents fraud. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, Julie, do you have a contact slide um, for, for, to, for people to reach you or Keith? Uh, I see there's a lot of interest there. The we questions. do have a general one, yes, but yeah, your contacts. So maybe hold that up there for a second for people to jot down. Yeah, and if anyone is interested in reaching Julie or Keith, please um, just forward an email. You can forward it to myself, jhoward at artcorp.com, uh, and I'll be happy to forward that on to Cornelius and Doug that will can reach out and be in contact with Julie and Keith as well. So um, that we can always uh, reach them, and they have their contact information up here for Ethica if you want to reach them directly, which is Right with that, right on the slide, 866-215-2883 or sales at ethica.com. Um, I just want to also let everyone know the rest of our schedule for Thursday and Friday. We have a really good um, session coming up tomorrow as well. Uh, that's, the title of that is Using Behavioral uh, Analytics to Spot Fraudsters. That will prove to be another really interesting one, and we do have guest presenters on that as well, besides, of course, our ARC experts. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, this is going to be presented by our director of our corporate risk management, a little bit separate area than our customer one. And this should prove to be a very uh, interesting conversation as well. It's PCI for travel agents, protecting valuable customer data. Uh, that's something we at ARC here are always uh, top of mind of and being trained on, so I think that you'll find interesting. Julie and Keith, before we sign off, do you have any closing statements you would like to say? Um, we really believe in collaboration and we are absolutely here to help, um, so please uh, feel free to reach out to us and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Keith? Yeah, beyond that, no, nothing further for me. I think we covered a lot of territory on the call. So, yeah, absolutely appreciate the opportunity, and we'll, we'll certainly answer everybody's questions. So thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Keith and Julie. Uh, Cornelius and Doug, anything on our side? Thank you, everyone, for attending, and Keith and Julie for your presentation. Yeah, great. And, again, 
most of all, thanks for um, all of our customers tuning in. We really appreciate it. Hope you can join us uh, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday. And don't forget, we have week three coming up and week four where we close on the 27th with a really informative panel. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll be back here tomorrow, same time, 2 p.m. East Coast time. Okay, guys, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julian Keith. Thanks, Cornelius and Doug. Thanks. Bye-bye.